I record on this computer. Okay. There we go. Recording in progress. Well, hello there, everybody, and a huge welcome to our Ready to Play Book 3 Making Progress launch party. Hooray! It's taken an absolute age for me to write this book and to um, to get it here, and it and it's published, printed, and ready and available for you to, to purchase. If you're watching this live, then you will find that the uh, sampler of one of the songs, Frere Jacques, is being put in the chat channel. If you haven't got it, then just make sure that you ask Ollie, who is my editor and helping him. That would be great. If everybody could also be on mute, that would be really helpful as we're recording this for later, um, for later use. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. So the point of today is I'm going to give you a quick whiz through all the different, uh, or I'm going to give you a quick whiz through, yeah, I'm going to give you an overview of all the songs that are in the series. I'm going to pick out the main themes and the main threads in book three. I'm going to give you some ideas of what was behind my thinking with this. But let's start, let's start as we always do with a song. So here's the very first song of the book. I'm hoping you can all see me okay. Jambo, jambo. Jumbo, 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 Now, jumbo means hello in Swahili, and it is the very first song in the book. Um, and we'll be coming back to Jambo in a few moments and I'll be telling you a little bit more about it. But first of all, here um, is something about the book and looking at the three strands that we've got. The first strand that runs throughout the book is the strand of compound time, introducing compound time. The second strand is looking at tonality and harmony. And the third strand is one I've called enrichment. In other words, it covers uh, several, several different things. Now, in this book, there are three piano pieces, uh, sorry, two piano pieces. There are, let me get my connection back, there are two piano pieces, one chant, and nine songs. And of those nine songs, three will already be known. I'm pretty sure that the three I've chosen are universally pretty well known. Each one, each song has the same method of demonstration, uh, of presentation, as in the other two books. So we have got, the Sally says, we have got I Can, and we have got the Ready to Play sections. Now, body percussion plays a really important role, actually, in a lot of the songs, and there are some lovely little body percussion icons that my illustrator, Graham Longdon, created for me. And the, the reason for including that more and more is that I think the, the age group or the uh, level that this is aimed at, you're going to probably find that they want to sing less and less. So again, the body percussion is there, more of a distraction. You know, if they get engrossed and engaged with doing body percussion, you'll find that they probably end up singing. Not all of them will. I certainly have one student who, who I really do um, have to very much encourage to get her to make a sound at all. But, you know, um, the body percussion, she's still learning, she's still listening, that still is really important. So in terms of the level for this particular series, this is very much what I see as a bridging book. It's bridging between, uh, let's call it elementary and late elementary, and those concepts you can see there, the compound time and the tonality and harmony in particular, along with another one which is semiquavers, that's in there as well. Those are all concepts that, that our students at the post-elementary level, going on to late elementary, that's what they need to know. And I often find at this, uh, at this stage, there's often a big sort of dip between what they can play and what they actually understand. So this is really very much that bridge to help them from to understand what they play. So, going on to compound time, I'm going to give you a quick look at what the songs are in compound time. 
and then look at the other parts of it as well, the other parts of the book. So four of the songs and the pieces are in compound time. And it, this is sort of taking you through the whole preparation, presentation and practice, the three P's as I like to call it, that lie behind everything that, uh, that I tend to, to do. And I've actually done it for you here. So Jambo, for example, this song is all about preparation. This is all about preparing for compound time. And I know from my own experience, but also from hearing from other teachers, how hard it is sometimes to teach compound time. So I use this song to just introduce the feel of compound time. That's all we're doing, we're introducing the feel. And you can see in the Sally Says here, um, Jambo has a lively and bouncy feel to it that is different from the previous songs in the Ready to Play series. And this is because it uses compound meter. And there you can see we've, we're already bringing out the idea of two beats in a bar. I'm already calling this compound duple meter. But then underneath I'm asking the student to listen again and see if they can come up with some of the words, which are these words, do they think best suit the, the feel of the song? Um, you know, we've got galloping, galloping, skipping, skipping, jig-jog, jig-jog, trotting, trotting, running, running. And you might want to go through that first. I'm not training on the songs though today, so I've got to watch out that I don't get stuck into it. But those words are ones that I have found you uh, work with, with getting them to understand the feel of compound time. Now the next song that is in compound time, this is row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. I think this is a known song. A lot of children will already say, yeah, I, I do know this. Um, if they've got younger siblings, then I'll often say, you might hear your younger, you know, especially if they're babies or toddlers or whatever. Uh, and they'll oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course they love to do that. They do love to do a song that they already know. So this is where we get into the presentation part of compound time. And in the, in, in the Sally Says, I've talked about dotted notes, because of course that's what it is. Um, and this, this particular page, I have to say, the, where you see the Sally Says, um, it's taken many, many, many rewrites. And it, I'm not entirely sure it's still there, but it's getting there. Um, so it's very hard to explain this on page. I would suggest you get your floor spots out. That's what I would do in a live lesson. I'd have my floor spots out and then it becomes really, really quite easy. So uh, we're introducing here the time signature of 6-8, obviously. And I've put here, and this is probably the hardest sentence to write. This is because a dotted crotchet can't be shown in the time signature. You can't write the number for a dotted crotchet in a time signature. So instead we use the next complete note value down, which is a quaver. That's the reason we have the 6-8 time signature. Okay, and the, the, the song also introduces them to rhythm language, which is on the following pages, which is Thai and T, 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 Ta, T, Ta, T, so. And then we come on to the practice of compound time. Now, this song here, The Keys of Canterbury, they certainly won't know, and you probably don't know it either, because it is a beautiful old English folk song. And it tells a tale of a young man who uh, is wooing his young lady. And he promises her all sorts of different um, riches, the keys of Canterbury, you know, which in the, uh, if, if you think three, four, five hundred years ago, Canterbury was sort of the centre of uh, um, church going, religion, etc. in this country. So this is something very precious. He also promises her a dress. I think he promises her a ring, a beautiful ring. And in the end, he promises her his heart. And of course, that wins the day for her. Again, glorious illustrations by Graham. Um, you can't quite see the second page, but Canterbury um, continues on the next page. So I think folk songs, our folk songs of our own heritage, in this case, England for me, are really important to acknowledge 
um, as they are worldwide. You know, we we started with Jambo, which is a folk song from um, in in Swahili. So here we have now a folk song from England, and this really for me highlights the oral and the let's call it aural for uh, to make a differentiation. The oral O R A L, the oral sense, which is all about the <coughs> the singing, the speech, and then the aural sense, A-U-R-A-L, which is about the listening. And of course, in, in olden days, people couldn't read and write, so history was passed down actually orally, by song, by stories, really very important. Let's listen to the folk song. Oh, and by the way, I'm not expecting them to necessarily learn this. It's not a song for them to sing necessarily. It is a song about listening and maybe learning fragments of it. And maybe the, be the, the, the more enthusiastic ones will learn the whole song, but that isn't the expectation. <clears throat> Here we go. Oh, madam, I will give to you the keys of Canterbury. And all the bells in London shall ring to make us merry. If you will be my love, my one and only dear, And come along with me anywhere. I shall not, sir, accept of you the keys of Canterbury, Nor all the bells in London shall ring to make us merry. I will not be your love, your one and only dear, And come along with you anywhere. Okay. So, just a point about uh, the video you've just seen. Um, Ollie has been working very hard. We went into uh, uh, a studio in the summer and we recorded all the songs. They are now available on the YouTube channel and I'll be pointing you in that direction later on in the, um, in the presentation. Okay, so the Keys of Canterbury, beautiful song as you can hear. A really important feature of the book, actually, is that of analysis, that of analysis. I do think it is so important that we encourage our students to be able to look at the pieces, the, the, the piano pieces that they're playing, the songs they're singing, and analyse them. And in, the, in this book, I've called them discovery files, and we've made a whole load of icons that will help them to um, uh, go through it and be very thorough. We'll look at that in a moment too. One other point I want to pick out from the Keys of Canterbury is the idea of transformation. And transformation is a lot of fun. I don't know whether any of you can look at the, uh, the song that you've got on um, page, what page are we on? Page 20, yes. And see if you can work out what that song is. Because it is a song you all know, it's very, very familiar. Do pop any ideas you've got into the, uh, into the chat and we might come back to that later and have another look at that. So I'll just leave it there for a second whilst you just have a little think. It has been transformed, this song, in two ways. As I said, it's a lot of fun. Okay, I'm going to move on now. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the analysis side of things. Um, the analysis, as I've said at the beginning of here, as musicians, it's important to understand the music from the inside out and discovering the facts about the piece, such as the meter, the time signature, the tone set and the interval range helps us to be ready to play. And it's called analysis. And there you can see is our, my analysis of the keys of Canterbury. So we have got the time signature, the tone set, which in this case is the La pentachord. Yeah, so that's what we mean by tone set. And again, tone set's something that you, you've known about since book one, the student will have done if they work through. If they haven't, then it's not a problem. It's a very easy concept to understand. The range, which in this one goes from La to Mi. Um, the length, so how many bars is it? 
What is the interval range? So here the interval range is a perfect fit. What's the structure, the phrase structure? It's A, A, B, and then an A1. Um, and the rhythmic elements. So here the rhythmic elements I've just put down as an upbeat because that is the new thing. You could also write down, um, you know, if there's a particular rhythm pattern like crotchet and the quaver that continually comes back, that could also go there. Um, and the melodic elements, which is mini to la, um, from intervals or, or pa melodic patterns that, again, are uh, quite embedded into it. And then what is the final note, which in this case is la. Yeah, and that's important. There are another couple of... Um, <clears throat> there are another couple of these uh, icons that appear later. Uh, not on that one, let me just go on to the next one. Oh, here, here we go. Um, it's actually the key. So later on, we, I introduce the idea of key signature, and at that point, and tonic comes in as well, and at that point, you'll see the key icon also appears. Okay, so let's move on to the final example of compound time. And this is a very delicate, beautiful romancer by Diabelli. And the focus here is on helping students to find the expressive qualities that are hidden behind the notes. For example, the use of half steps. And <clears throat> I help them to discover, to analyse, to look at this and to begin to understand why that's important that they know this. Because they have to cherish those half steps because they're so, so beautiful. So I've set them the task of counting. How many half steps can you find between A and B flat? Um, and I found 15, but it could be that I got that wrong. I don't know. So it, it, it's an interesting little task to look at that. 15 half steps. Wow, in this very short piece. You can see we've got the discovery files there. You can see we've got these utterly beautiful illustrations done by Graham Longden once again. So this is the final piece that is um, looking specifically at the introduction, presentation, practice of compound time. And as it's a duet, here is the whole thing played by myself and by Ollie. Hopefully. Nope. One moment. It's just got to get its signal back. So I'd like to play for you now the complete version of the Romancer by Diabelli. Now, because this... Oh, decided to um, go back. Let's try again. So I'd like to play for you now the complete version of the Romancer by Diabelli. Now, because this is duet part and I can't play both parts, I'm really delighted to introduce to you Oliver Wood, who's come to join me to play the primo part.
Lovely piece. Thank you so much, Ollie, for joining me on that one. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's a beautiful piece and it will help the students to really get that lovely, romantic, expressive uh, quality, I think, into their play. Think about that. It's a very, very loud uh, lorry going past there. And, and also to um, get that lovely, lilting 6-8 fill. So let's move on now to the second uh, thread that runs through the book. And this is mostly in the second half. So compound time dominates the first half. Tonality and harmony, harmony dominate the second half. And we look at major tonality, natural minor tonality, harmonic minor tonality, also tonic dominant leading note and subdominant function, and bass lines. I couldn't fit in melodic minor, convincingly enough, to this particular book um, within its confines. So I, I, I think we can cope, though, with just the ones that we have introduced here. So we begin by doing Chumbara. And Chumbara is a fast and furious um, song that has a lovely scale um, pattern in the middle of it. Have a little listen. In fact, well, let's all do a little bit of activity, shall we? What I'd like you to do is some body percussion. So you're going to clap, click, clap. Yeah, you want to start to do that. You'll notice at a certain point I will stop doing this, but um, you can just keep doing it. Mm, I go, chumbara, 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 chum, 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 chumbara, 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 chum, chum, chum. There we go. That's all there is to it. It's very short and uh, very catchy. You can go fast now. Chumbara, 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 chumbara. And I would suggest when you're introducing it, you do it pretty much as fast as you can because then they go, oh, oh, oh. So, um, this is an important song though uh, because it introduces um, some really central concepts to the idea of tonality and harmony as well. You can see on the uh, second page, there is the concept of tetrachords. Now I'm really pleased with this because um, this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And actually to have it in a book now for me is, um, it's gonna revolutionize what I do really with my students. So tetrachords, four notes, yeah, in this particular case, do, re, mi, fa, there's our pattern of four notes. And a tetrachord, uh, a bit like a pentachord, has a particular pattern of whole steps and half steps. So do, re, whole step, re, mi, whole step, mi, fa, half step. And this helps our students to begin to understand tonic and dominant function. So we do the tetrachords first, and then after that we move on and we start to look at tonic and dominant. I am missing out lots of pages by the way, so you might find that things suddenly appear that you, don't, you haven't found out about, but this is just to give you the main points really. So on this page you can see I am introducing this whole idea. And what I say is, a major scale begins on Do, the starting note of the first tetrachord. Its role or the role or function of Do is to give a strong sense of coming home to a place of rest and safety. This is really what uh, Western classical music is all about, this idea of tonic, home, dominant, away. The second tetrachord starts on So. This is also important and its role or function is to provide a contrast a sense of going away, of moving on. Do, of course, is the first degree of the major scale, and so is the fifth degree. And so those notes are also known as their functional names of tonic and dominant. And then what I've done below that is try to give everything in one neat little package. You can see do, re, mi, fa, so, la, di, do, it's there. Underneath, I have a fixed pitch for C major scale, under that, I've got the numbers, the degrees of the scale. Under that, I have highlighted which ones are the tonic and the dominant. And under that, you can see that it is also written out on the stave. Then, this is the scale in the key of C major. C is the tonic note and G is the dominant note. 
So that for me is a really crucial page to help students with understanding. And I find with my students, they know where to look to find the tonic of a piece. They know it's the very bottom note. They look at it, they are able to identify what note it is, then they are able to look at the key signature and identify whether it's major or minor. Or sometimes they just know that orally. Key signatures, yes, we move on to the key signatures here as well. Now, I'm just going to say that, again, I, I, the students will know this. They will have played scales. They will know these things. They will know how to play them on the piano. But will they understand them? Not always. In fact, not often, I think. So this is actually revision work for them, helping them towards that level of understanding. And that gives them that self-knowledge to then progress confidently. Okay, so let's now move on <clears throat> to the next one. So the next song, lovely, rousing, sort of caroling song. Hey ho, nobody at home, meat nor drink nor money have I none. Still I will be merry, very merry, hey ho. And it just goes round and round and round because it's a canon and there's lots of canons. We'll come back to canons in a moment. So this is the natural minor scale, which I think is the starting point for all minor scale knowledge and work. The same presentation regarding uh, um, the, 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 yeah, the same presentation is used for this scale. But note that in the, in the minor, la is now the tonic. La, la, ti, do, re, mi, now becomes the dominant. Okay, so la, do, mi, those are the tonic and the dominant notes. And this is one of the big features of relative sulfur, okay? Of relative sulfur. We're not talking um, tonic sulfur and we're not talking about um, fixed sulfur. Those use different, um, uh, the, those use a different approach. With relative sulfur, do always stays do, but la is taken as the minor. Once again here, body percussion is used. Now, up till now, we're now on song nine. Um, once the discovery files have been introduced, you will find they are there. So I think it's song four, five, six, seven, and eight all have discovery files. There is no discovery file here. However, you can find the extra discovery files at the back of the book. So we're just saving space for absolutely the essentials in the book itself. And then we're moving on to the next song, which is Ah, poor bird, take thy flight. This is such a beautiful song. Oh, it's so expressive, uh, really is, and delicate. Um, so the same approach, though, is here with the harmonic minor. And here we're introducing the leading note, obviously, because we have now got the sharpened seventh degree of the scale, which in so far, so becomes C. So becomes C. Um, and there'll be more on that in, in the training and more explanation behind that. So, our poor bird, beautiful song. Okay, we are then moving on to the uh, idea of bass lines. Of course, that comes out of harmony, it comes out of tonality. And this is a song, another one that will be very well known. And I think as pianists, as my lovely colleague Lucinda Macbeth Young likes to say, we should all be able to play Happy Birthday. And there's no reason why your post grade one student can't play the accompaniment to Happy Birthday. I absolutely think they should be able to. And what I've done with this is I've presented it again with lots of, um, uh, uh, as an oral exercise for them, get them listening to the bass line, see if they can work it out. And then, as you can see on uh, the, the following page, page 59, they're going to try and sing and play the bass line at the same time here. So, um, I'll just see, oh no, I can't change. But they're going to see if they can play the bass line and sing the melody along with it. And then on the following page, they get the, uh, the actual harmony, the actual uh, simple accompaniment. They don't need to play the melody. Everybody sings the melody. They need to play the accompaniment. 
I have to say that page 59 is probably my favourite page in the whole book because I just love what Graham did with the word subdominant. I did say think submarine Graham and um, he absolutely has thought submarine because of course the subdominant is five notes below the tonic. It's not the note underneath the dominant, that's not why it's called subdominant, it's called subdominant because it's five notes beneath the tonic. Okay, so that's the end if of the um, harmony tonality strand. I'm going to move on now to the third strand, which as I've said is got a sort of a general title of enrichment. And in this one, we're looking at a variety of things. So Summer Goodbye, this is back to song number two now. And this is pulling out the idea of motifs. You know, you learn a, um, a Beethoven sonata, it has motifs. You learn a piece by Schumann, it has motifs. Motifs run throughout all music. These are musical ideas, short musical ideas that are the building blocks of the music. Summer Goodbye, very, very beautiful lyrical song that um, they can really learn about motifs. And there's also the opportunity, if you want to, although I didn't develop it in this, to, to do a sequence because the second, the third and the fourth phrase is, is a beautiful little sequence. The other thing I do develop in this, though, is the idea of ternary form. Okay, so A, B, A. So, returns to the idea, really, that music is full of patterns, I think, this, this uh, some goodbye. Now, here's Frere Jacques, which you should all have a sampler for. <coughs> I have to say as well, there are seven videos to accompany this. Got a bit carried away with Frere Jacques. Um, seven videos to accompany this over on the YouTube channel. Um, this continues to encourage analysis, um, it's got some score reading, of course it's a song that they will know, but you can get them to do the body percussion, which is a lot of fun. You can also get them to see if they can sing it in canon with you, can they play it in canon with themselves, all pretty challenging stuff, um, but lots of fun. We've got major and minor hex chord, major and minor six. It's also got, as you can see, um, Mahler, because in Mahler's first symphony, he takes this same melody, he turns it into the minor, transformation, remember that word I've used before, um, he transforms it into the minor and he writes it as one of the movements of his first symphony. And here we've got a little bit of that, just a short part of that symphony, and you can get them to follow the score along, follow the different voices, for example. I think the, it's the um, double bass that comes in first. It's a very famous double bass um, part, this is. Um, and then the other instruments that come in. So a nice little bit of enrichment there. And then I've put at the bottom just a very simple arrangement of the piece I've done for, for them myself. So Frere Jacques, I think you, you, you've got one... Um, uh, one sampler but there's lots and lots and lots of value in that and I'll be creating another video for that as well okay another fast and furious one this is for semi quavers again go and watch the video for how, how to do that one um, semi quavers a really important new rhythmic feature in simple time now that uh, the students need to learn post grade one post elementary level before they can move on um, it was difficult to know exactly what um, what illustrations to use here, so I just got Graham to do because chicka chicka cha cha. There is no clue in the word there, so um, I didn't particularly want chickens running all over the place either. We have Frere Jacques in the previous one with a with a cockerel, I think. So here we've got lots of uh, four divisions of four. All the illustrations, the abstract illustrations you can see, all have divisions of four going on. Um, and then I've tried with the ready to play to combine the use, uh, the new rhythm, along with their new knowledge of tonality, playing scales in different rhythms, for example. And the very, very final piece of the book is again, it's once again a piano piece. And for many of you, this will already be very familiar. And I'm delighted that Chi Hua Tan agreed to let me feature this piece in her book. 
Um, at the time of recording, this is currently a grade one piece, a sort of a, a, an elementary level piece uh, for ABRSM. At this stage, I'm imagining that students will find this quite easy. And even if they've learnt it before, they might quite enjoy going through all the different activities and might find them quite challenging because the idea is that it's taking them on that um, journey of learning to practice intelligently, learning to be engaged in their practice, learning to sort of mess around. Those of you that know me well know I do messy piano. This is a messy piano approach, if you like, to um, how to approach learning a piece of music. I see this as a self-study piece. If you go through the activities with them, depending on their need, then send them off to see how they get on with learning the piece if they've not ever learnt it before. So as I say, I think they will probably be playing at pieces generally above this level. However, as a self-study piece, you need something that is well within their capabilities. Okay. So I've mentioned the YouTube channel and indeed um, there are lots and lots of videos for pupils and parents and teachers over on the YouTube channel. So do go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. You can see I've done a teacher introduction, that's specifically for you. There is a, uh, an introduction for the, your students as well about the book. And there's an introduction for the parents on this book. Um, and so do please point parents in the direction. There are loads and loads of videos for Ready to Play Book 3 already over there. Um, and I think there are more um, audio files and things on SoundCloud. But you, the, the Ready to Play YouTube is really the place to go, I think. And of course, um, there are, of course, the, the, the Ready to Play Facebook group. If you're not on it already, then do come and join us. You just need to put in Ready to Play Music uh, to find it. And there are, ooh, there's over 500 of us now. So this, this photo was taken a while ago. So thank you so much for joining me whilst I wander my way through the uh, presentation of Ready to Play Making Progress Book 3. As I said, I think it's, um, it's got lots in it that will be very useful for you as teachers that I think you'll, will help your students to deepen their knowledge and understanding of these various really important concepts that they need to know in order to continue their piano journey with confidence. So, I think I shall stop my share now and come off screen and see if there are any questions that anybody would like to answer. Thank you Ollie for sharing the um, YouTube channel. Rachel's asking, yeah, do you expect the pupil to be able to play the prima part? Yes, yes, basically. And uh, one, one, I was going to, um, I'll just come back to that actually, because with the primo part, let me just put it here, yeah, I'll just show it to you, just like that, don't know whether you can see that, it's back to front on my camera, I don't know whether it is on yours, but you'll notice that I have made the decision with the primo part not to include the key signature, that's because it's in G minor, and that's because at this moment in the book I haven't introduced the concept of key signatures. So the teacher's part has got the key signature and that might be something worth just um, highlighting or not. I don't want to make life complicated. And I would expect that they will learn quite a, a, a proportion of this by listening, by copying, by imitating. What is important is that they get the feel and the playing of the compound time and they begin to see some of those rhythm patterns that they've already learned appearing on the page here. So I will be interested to see how you all get on with this actually, because um, I think it will work well, but just don't expect them to learn it as in start at bar one and play it all the way through. It's in a, a nice G minor pentachord position. So it shouldn't prove too, too problematic because both hands play in unison. Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> okay, 
Hey, Jim is asking getting a student license. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ollie there. Hi. <laughs> um, studio license. Um, we haven't really discussed studio licenses yet. We, we're sort of with the introduction of this book, we are definitely looking at, at producing a value pack which combines the three books together. But studio licenses is definitely something that, that would be of interest. Um, leave that with me. Um, I'll post any updates on the Facebook group and, and let you know if we can move forward with that. But yeah, that's, that sounds like definitely a good idea. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, the way I use studio licenses is that I have a studio license, my student has the book. I do think there is value in having a book if, if uh, finance is allowed, because it implies a seriousness, to be honest. And I find that bits of paper get lost. Yeah, bits of paper get lost. A book doesn't get lost. Um, and somehow, if it's in a book, they do pay more attention to it. That, that is my view. Um, having worked with studio licenses and bits of paper, um, <clears throat> you know, for the past three or four years, you have to be very, very organized and get them with folders and all sorts of things. And they put the music in the folder if you're going to churn out pieces of paper and then they get slightly torn or something happens to them. This kind of lasts, you know, it sort of lasts. Um, a lot of theory. Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of, of, of orally based theory because you can't get away from it. You, you have to understand compound time. You have to understand tonality in order to be able to move forward. So this is why I say this is a bridge. I'm hoping that it's bridging that gap between their playing and the theory. That's the idea, that it will help them to deepen their understanding. What theory book? I, I don't know, Ijeoma, because it's very personal. It it's, depends on you and the way that you teach and where they've come from and where they're, where they're going to. Um, personally, you know, I don't really use theory books very much at all at the moment. Um, if you need to get them through a theory exam, then obviously you have to prepare them in some way or other for that. If I do use a theory book at the moment, it's probably going to be the Blitz books from Samantha Coates. Yeah. So thank you for that question. Are there any other questions? Everybody's very quiet today. Anastasia. I'll just read this out for people who are listening. And... Um, you're saying you love the look of the books, have at least students for whom this is directly applicable and it's far more considered than complete. Yeah, I like that. Far more considered than complete. Do you know, that's exactly how I feel about it as well. It's far more considered than complete than the way I currently teach. Because, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's why it's taken quite a long time to pull together, to put that consider. I can't tell you the number of times I've sat in a particular chair and thought, Oh, no, I'm going to have to change that. And poor old Ollie, you know, I keep sending rewrites. Back. No, that sentence isn't right, Ollie. And all the time I've been condensing, condensing, condensing and trying to be as precise as I possibly can. And then going, oh, is that really true? I need to go and look this up somewhere else. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping. So thank you for saying that, Anastasia, because I would love to know whether when you start to use it, you're finding it that way. Um, Lovely. Good, good, good. So uh, I think we might um, just stop the recording now and any, any other questions people can, can ask. But thank you all so much for coming live. Um, thank you for watching. If you've been watching it um, on, the, on the, what's it called? Not the play up, on the replay. And um, I hope you have many hours of fun with your students doing ready to play book three making progress Whee. i'm going to say a big thank you though before i finish to um to the wonderful graham longden for the beautiful illustrations i mean they really are very glorious and they just bring the book to life for me um to all my students to whom i've dedicated the book to past and present who have both tried and tested this with me even without me knowing that we're trying and testing it they they have been doing it but um all my current students have had copies of the book already, all signed to say thank you to them all. 
I'd also like to say again thank you to Ollie for all his patience and um, dedication to getting the editing right um, and also to um, the people who proofread this for me um, so Sharon Mark Teddett from the Curious Piano Teachers, Fiona Hedges and also my brother-in-law David Cathcart and they all went over it with a very fine tooth comb so we have our fingers crossed that there aren't that many mistakes in this one but let's see I'm sure you'll find some there's your new year task thank you all for watching once again thanks a lot <laughs>